The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let me read you a few verses from Isaiah. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him and who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planned, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's stand and sing to this God, the true and the living God. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. God and our Father in heaven. We are here gathered together today to worship you and in faith to behold our King, to adore our Lord Jesus Christ. In his lifetime, despised by the authorities, rejected by his own people, a man of sorrows, no stranger to grief, 
His own family didn't understand him. His closest friends deserted him. And in the end, he was crucified as a common criminal. He felt the nails. He bore the guilt. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. And he rose victorious, victorious o'er the grave. And that is why, O oh Lord, all over the world, men and women like ourselves are meeting together for this specific purpose, to worship the Lord Jesus. Whether in cavernous cathedrals or in makeshift huts, men and women just like us are desiring to behold the Lord Jesus Christ. His is a name that is so precious to us. His is a name that speaks of a glorious salvation. Salvation from a way of life that is centered on self. Salvation from a worldview that sees nothing beyond itself in the physical. Salvation from the power of sin that defaces your image in us. Salvation from your wrath, which we confess is rightly deserved. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him not to condemn us, not to judge us, but to liberate us. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And Lord God, we also confess before you that there are many things that cause us to question our faith. Just as when a river bank breaks, doubts can flood our minds when it seems that our prayers are unheard. When no sure road ahead presents itself. When those that we respect depart from Scripture's teaching. And that can shake us to the core. We can feel the ground beneath us trembling. But we thank you and we praise you that doubts are dispelled when we turn to Jesus. When we have our eyes fixed on Jesus. What he has started, he will finish. And he will build his church. And the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And he will have his people with him in heaven. His holy bride. The church for whom he died. O oh, Heavenly Father, it is our sincere and earnest prayer that in all that we do today, we would behold our Savior Jesus, love him more, follow him more closely. And this we ask as we say together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please take a seat. Very warm welcome to our service of worship here at Hope Church, Blackwood and Kirkman Hill, particularly. If you don't normally worship with us, then we're especially glad to see you. And of course, to those of you who are watching at home, we're delighted that you are also able to join us in our worship together. Now let me just draw your attention to a few things going on in our Hope Church family. Uh, first of all, the, the first of the Elders District's lunches is today, and I hope if you are in the district uh, where Alan and Neil Crooks are the elders, that you've remembered that, and you've brought some lunch with you. Even if you haven't brought some lunch with you, don't worry about that. There's always tea and coffee, and it's through in the large hall, the 60 room, uh, after the service. Time for fellowship, also a chance to speak to your elder and to, if you've got any concerns or anything you want to raise, then it's a golden opportunity to do that. This evening, uh, we celebrate Holy Communion and I do want to encourage you, uh, we do believe that Communion, the Lord's Supper, is important, an important part of our faith. It is something that the Lord Jesus himself instituted and uh, as often as we meet, we want to remember him and also look forward to his coming again. 
What else do I want to draw your attention to? You'll have seen that we're organising a family fund day, Saturday the 24th of June. More details about that in the coming weeks. Next Sunday, Douglas Cranston will be preaching. I have a long-standing commitment to preside at a communion weekend up north in Tain. And uh, I do trust that you'll be praying for me in that regard as well. Uh, the two General Assemblies, Church of Scotland and our own Free Church of Scotland. Church of Scotland, when it started yesterday, our starts on Monday. What a relief to know there will be a huge contrast between the two of them. And uh, it's wonderful to be part of a church that has a vision for growth rather than for decline. Uh, I'm also disintimating uh, Bobby McCauley's funeral on Friday. The details are there, 11 o'clock at South Lanarkshire Crematorium. And please do be remembering our sister Moira in prayer uh, this coming week. And also, I think I mentioned last week about the Summer Sunday School. If you can sign up for that, we'd be most grateful. Just one week during the summer, that would be wonderful to make sure that we're still uh, catering for the, the boys and girls. And then the last thing I want to draw your attention to, parking. Parking. Now, uh, we have to be very thoughtful about others in this. Please remember that the two sites right next to the front door are exclusively for families with children. We want them to be safe. We don't want them to have to be walking in when there's cars coming back and forward. And then also remember, the parking spaces over there are exclusively for those with a disabled badge. So please be remembering that as well. And all these things, let's just be mindful of one another. We don't want to be selfish. We don't want to be causing any danger. So please be thinking about that parking. Well, there was a the thing about gardening as well. Just draw your attention to that as well. Right, before boys and girls and teenagers go off to their thing, here's my question for you. How can you show somebody that you love them? What would you do for somebody that you love? How can you show love? Any suggestions? Ruby, you can help them. It's a great answer. Anything else you can do? Uh, yep. Kidman? Be kind to them. I like that. Yeah. Any other suggestions about showing love for people? Well, I think those are two very good answers so far. What... Um, what sign could you, what, what could you use to symbolize love? What picture could you use to show love to somebody? Maybe if you were drawing a card or something, what would you draw to show love? Any ideas about that? Um, you, got, you got another idea? <coughs> a love heart, perhaps? What were you going to say? You could what? You could draw the pair, a picture of the person. Like, Those are great answers. Well, in my bag, I've got something I want to show you that I think speaks very loud about love. Let me show you this. I wonder what I've got in my bag that speaks to me very loud about love. Did, did any of the men know what this is? <laughs> what is this, Quinton? Do you know? You don't know? No. Do you know what it is? It's not a head covering? No. No. Of course, Ruby, what is it? It's a, it's a dish towel, isn't it? Now, why would I think that a dish towel speaks about love? It's a dish or a tea towel, a dish towel. How, how, does, how is that about love? Because, as Ruby said earlier on, we show our love not just by speaking about it, I love you, I love you, I love you, but by doing something. By doing something, by helping the people that we love. 
And you know, that is what the Bible tells us about God. The Bible does tell us God loves us. Lots of places in the Bible it says God loves you. But more than just speaking to us about how much he loves us, God has shown us how he loves us by doing something. By doing something. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to be our savior. And I'm thinking about two verses in particular. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And another one in Romans chapter 5 says, While we were still sinners, God showed his love to us by Christ dying for our sin. So love is not just a matter of saying that we love one another. It's about serving one another about doing something that shows our love. And uh, before we pray, we're going to sing about that. From heaven you came, helpless babe, entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and to give your life that we might live. And after we've sung that, we'll sing, uh, we'll pray, and then you can go to Sunday school and Bible class. Please say after me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you have shown us that you love us by sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. Help us to truly follow him by serving others. In his name. Amen. Okay, Sunday school and Bible class. And it is worth asking the question, how does the Lord know that we love him? How does the Lord know that we love him? Now, we know that he loves us. 
He demonstrates that in a thousand different ways, day and daily. And of course, at the cross of Calvary, we see his love shown in the most pure way, that sacrificial and unconditional love. We know that the Lord loves us. But how does he know that we love him? And we might say that we tell him that we love him and we sing that we love him. But is love just about what we say? Because words are cheap. Do we show him that we love him? Do we speak as those who are in love with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we act as those who care about the honor of the Lord Jesus? Do we think like those who want to be like Jesus? Well, as we come before the Lord with our prayer of confession, it gives us an opportunity to revisit the week that has passed, to confess to Almighty God those words, those deeds, those thoughts that have not only been unloving towards others, but have been unloving towards him. Let's pray together. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Heavenly Father, you love us. But we have not loved you. We have ignored the commands of our Lord Jesus, preferring our own way to his. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. Lord God, hear us as we confess our sins to you. Help us, dear Lord, always to be honest with you, so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. <clears throat> Now we're going to turn back to the book of Esther. We're going to read two chapters, chapters 5 and 6. And Ian Scott is going to lead us in our readings. Thank you, Ian. Esther, chapter 5. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. The king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half of the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it please the king, Esther replied, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet that I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now what is your petition? It will be given you, and what is your request, even up to Half of the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it please the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw that Mordecai at the king's gate had observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. And nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh's wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, 
and all the ways the king had honoured him and how he had elevated him above, above the other nobles and the officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I am the only person Queen Esther has invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows built, 75 feet high, and ask the king in the morrow to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, and he had the gallows built. That night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. It was found recorded that there Mordecai had exposed Bignatha and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honour and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him, his attendants answered. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the gallows he had erected for him. His, attend his attendants answered, Haman is standing in the court. Bring him in, the king ordered. When Haman entered, the king asked him, what should be done for the man that the king delights to honour? Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honour than me. So he answered the king, for the man the king delights to honour, have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn and the horse the king has risen, one with the royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to the one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honour and lead him on the horse through the city streets proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Go at once, the king commanded Haman. Get the robe and the horse, and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. Do not delect, neglect anything that you have recommended. So Haman got the robe and the horse. He robed Mordecai and led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, This is what is done for the man the king delights to honour. Afterwards, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman rushed home with his head covered in grief and told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had happened to him. His advisers and his wife Zeresh said to him, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. While they were yet and still talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Amen, and may God bless this reading of his word. Thank you very much, Ian. <clears throat> I'm going to divide uh, today's sermon into two parts, uh, not equal parts. The first part will be much longer than the second part, and we'll break between the two parts to sing again but before we begin we're going to stand and we're going to sing we still know that I am God and thee O Lord I put my trust
Heavenly Father, as we turn to your word now, may what we have been singing be the truth, the truth for us, that in the ups and downs, in the vagaries of life, in the challenges, in the opposition, in the suffering, that our trust would be in you completely, utterly in you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, last week we were left with a cliffhanger, weren't we? The villain of the story, Haman the Agagite, has persuaded King Xerxes to issue a proclamation that a certain people within his empire should be exterminated without actually specifying who those people are. But the actual proclamation spells it out. The Jews. And chapter 4 verse 3 tells us that quite naturally there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many Jews lay in sackcloth and ashes. And among them is Mordecai who gets word to Esther about what is happening. She, of course, is secluded in luxurious ignorance. But it has occurred to Mordecai that she is in a position to save her people. Perhaps, indeed, this is why she is queen. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Esther, however, is not so sure. It's a month since she has seen the king, and to approach him without being summoned is to ask to risk the death penalty, no matter who you are. After all, remember what happened to Queen Vashti. Mordecai is not going to take no for an answer. Chapter 4, verse 12. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Mordecai has no doubt that God will not let his covenant people perish. Esther can either be an instrument in God's hands for saving his people, or she can hide under royal protection and suffer judgment. Mordecai's threat works. And from now on, from now on, it's Esther who is calling the shots. Chapter 4, verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king. And even though it is against the law, and if I perish... I perish. And the chapter ends by telling us that Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. She is calling the shots now. Okay, so we pick up the story. And it is day three. And we shouldn't miss the significance of that as Christians. The third day. The day of resurrection. The day when life conquers death. And Esther puts on her royal robes. Actually, the text literally says she puts on royalty. She puts on royalty. This is power dressing, Persian style. She wants to remind Xerxes why he chose her to be his queen. But it's been 30 days since he called for her, who has been sharing his bed for the past month. Now, do you remember a couple of weeks ago, I pointed out that little reference in chapter 2, verse 19, to a second assembly of virgins? What if she has a new rival? So externally, Esther is regal, dignified, every bit a queen. Internally, her heart is pounding. She stands at the entrance to the throne room. Will he hold out the gold scepter and allow her to approach? Or will this be his opportunity to get rid of a second queen? Verse 2. When he saw Queen Esther, 
standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. Whew. And did you notice it's Queen Esther? And when Xerxes addresses her, he calls her Queen Esther. Now, she's only been called Queen Esther once before in the book. But from now on, this is who she is. Queen Esther. And what does she want? Simply to invite the king and Haman to a banquet. Ah, she knows the way to her man's heart, doesn't she? And notice in verse 5 that the king does, as Esther says, bring Haman at once so that we may do what Esther asks. So first it was Mordecai, now it's the king. She is calling the shots. And at dinner the king asks Esther what is her request, and all she asks is that he and Haman come back the next day for another banquet. So what's going on here? What's going on? Why does she not just present her real request there and then? Well, I think the point is that she is backing Xerxes into a corner. Because three times he will have to promise to grant her petition. So that when we get to chapter 7, and she throws herself on his mercy and begs for her life and the life of her people, he has no choice but to grant it. Like the Roman general Fabius. She conquers by delay. But let's not forget God. God's finger directing minute events for the salvation of his people. That night, Xerxes can't sleep. I'm not told why. Now what do you do when you can't sleep? Do you lie in bed and count sheep? Do you get up and make a cup of tea? You could use the opportunity to pray. Kim says she just listens to one of my sermons and she's back to sleep in no time whatsoever. <laughs> Perhaps you read. And that's what Xerxes decides to do. Only being king, he gets a servant to read to him, which is a kind of precursor to the audio book, isn't it? And Xerxes being Xerxes, he wants to hear the chronicles of his reign. And the scribe gets to that bit about Mordecai exposing the plot to assassinate the king. And then when the scribe moves on to the next bit, without mentioning what reward Mordecai received, the king interrupts. Wait, wait, wait a minute, verse 3. What honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? Nothing. The attendants say, well, this is a major oversight, isn't it? This is something that has to be rectified and rectified immediately, now. But, but what to do? And it's always in the story, Xerxes needs advice. Never does anything without taking advice. Who is in the court, he asks. And by chance, Haman has just arrived. Now, what is Haman doing in the court so early in the morning? Well, after that little soiree with the king and the queen the night before, Haman had left the palace walking on air. But as he passed the gate, there was Mordecai. It says in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 9, Mordecai neither rose nor showed fear in his presence. Pop went Haman's balloon. Haman provides us with a very interesting character study in the kind of person for whom enough is never enough. The kind of person for whom enough is never enough. He goes home, he calls his wife, gets his friends together, and what does he do? He boasts. He boasts about all that he has, his vast wealth, his many sons, the way the king has honored him, and the icing on the cake. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But, now to you and to me and just about anybody else, this is such a small thing. This one man, this Jew, 
will not give him the recognition that he craves. And it is eating away at him. Chapter 5, verse 13. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. You know, we often talk about people's false gods, the, the idols that they worship. And, well, we tend to think about money and maybe their career, even their family. Anything to which people, in effect, will just make any sacrifice for. Any sacrifice. For Haman, his idol was psychological. It wasn't enough to be wealthy. It wasn't enough to have a big family. It wasn't even enough that the king had promoted him above all the other nobles in the land. <clears throat> being important, being significant in itself was not enough. Everybody had to acknowledge it. Everybody had to acknowledge that he was important, that he was significant. He craved recognition. And that inner God, that inner idol had to be fed just like any of the gods who were fed with sacrifices on the altars in their temples and it was fed when others bowed down to him, when others recognized you're him and you're important but when it was challenged when it was ignored the result was terrible absolutely terrible and his friends and his wife know this. They know how to feed Haman's inner God. And you know, rather than advise him, just rise above the situation. Only one man. Rather than appeal to the better man, because there is no better man to appeal to, they suggest, erect a gallows. Chapter 4, verse 14. 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged in it then go with the king to the dinner and be happy 75 feet, that's high that's very high that's 7 stories high but you see that's the point Haman wants everybody to see far and wide see what happens to those who cross him and so we read, this suggestion delighted Haman. And that, my friends, is why Haman is in the court first thing in the morning. He needs the king's permission to execute Mordecai. And what follows, my friends, surely must be one of the most comical scenes in the entire Bible. Who is in the court? asked the king. Haman, bring him in. And before Haman gets a chance to say anything, the king asks him, what should be done for the man the king delights to honor? Now, I want you to notice this. <clears throat> in verse 3, the king asks his attendants, what honor and recognition, honor and recognition, has Mordecai received for this? Now the Hebrew word for recognition, gadula, it means dignity. It can even mean what high office. The king is wondering what honor and promotion has Mordecai received for this? Honor and recognition, you see. But when you get to verse 6, the king only asks what should be done for the man he delights to honor. And I am going to suggest that this is what throws Haman. Because there was no higher office to which Haman could be promoted. Remember, well, he boasted that the king had elevated him above all the other nobles and officials in the land. If the king had repeated what he said earlier on, what well, honor and recognition, honor and dignity, honor and, and promotion, dignity, that would have suggested to Haman Oh, there's somebody that he wants to promote. Somebody else he wants to promote. But all the king says is, the man the king delights to honor. Well, who is there that the king would rather honor than me, thinks Haman. 
Old Matthew Henry says this. Self-admirers and self-flatterers are really self-deceivers. So with himself in mind, Haman advises the king. And, and listen to how many times he uses the word royal. And how he emphasizes the man the king delights to honor. So he says, for the man the king delights to honor. Have them bring a royal robe the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor, and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Four times. He might as well have asked to sit on the throne with a crown on his own head. That's what he really wants. He wants the same kind of recognition that the king gets. But here's the joke. While Haman is telling Xerxes what he wants for himself, the king is only hearing, oh, this is really good advice. This is really good advice and, and, and how best to honor the man that Haman is actually wanting to destroy. Go at once, command Xerxes. Get the robe and the horse and do just as you have suggested. For, do, 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 Mordecai the Jew, who sits at the king's gate, do not neglect anything you have recommended. Can you not just see the blood draining from Haman's face? I'm surprised he didn't collapse there and then. And so he does precisely what he himself had suggested. But he doesn't have a choice, does he? The shame, the humiliation, as he leads Mordecai through the streets proclaiming, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And here's another interesting thing. It turns out that the king knew that Mordecai was a Jew. Go do that for Mordecai the Jew, he says. He doesn't seem to have any prejudice against the Jews. What a fool that man was. What a fool that he had unwittingly signed the death warrant of a man he wanted to honor. But when it's all over, Haman rushes home, tells his wife and friends everything that's happened. Well, they do a quick round of, a, a turn around, don't they? You know, yesterday they're pandering to his vanity. Now they're seeing the writing on the wall. Oh, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. And while they're still talking, the king's eunuchs arrive to escort Haman to Esther's banquet. Let's just stop there for a wee minute and let's sing. I rest in God alone. From him comes my salvation. My soul finds rest in him. My fortress I'll not be shaken. Let's stand.
course of this series, I've repeatedly quoted Matthew Henry's observation, you know, regarding any direct mention of God's name. But though the name of God be not in it, the finger of God is, directing many minute events for the bringing about of his people's deliverance. And he goes on to say, the particulars are not only surprising and very entertaining, but edifying and very encouraging to the faith and hope of God's people in the most difficult and dangerous times. Edifying and encouraging to the faith and hope of God's people in the most difficult and dangerous times. Just think about how we got to where we are today in the story. Queen Vashti had to be deposed. And Esther had to be chosen as queen. And Mordecai had to overhear the plot to assassinate the king, but not be rewarded. Then the king had to accept Esther's invitation. He had to have a sleepless night. And Haman had to be in a rush to see the king to request Mordecai's execution. Take any one of these out of the equation and Haman's devilish plan would have gone ahead. But God is sovereign, even over the most minute events. And it does raise a question for us. If God has the future planned out already, why bother praying? Why bother praying? Uh, to be more specific, if Esther had not fasted those three days, and of course prayer and fasting go together, would it have made any difference? Any difference at all? I mean, after all, didn't Mordecai warn her that if she didn't do something, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place? The God of Israel would be faithful to his covenant people with or without Esther. So what difference did the prayer and fasting make? It's clear from the text that the change came not in God's plan to save his people, but in Esther herself. In Esther herself. Initially, she can only think of herself and her neck. After three days of prayer and fasting, she could declare, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. In other words, she will do the right thing, not knowing how the story is going to end. She will do the right thing. She reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. Remember how they refused to bow down before Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue, even though they were aware that the penalty would be death. What God will be able to rescue you from my hands, declares Nebuchadnezzar. And what do the three friends say? If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. If we perish, we perish. You see, there is a danger that we confuse our belief in the sovereignty of God with mere fatalism. You know, case sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. What's for you will no go by you. We are not fatalists. We are not fatalists. We are Christians. And we believe in a loving Heavenly Father who is working all things out for our good, our eternal good. We do not pray in order to tell God what he doesn't know. We do not pray in order to get God to change his mind. We certainly do not pray because we do not believe in the sovereignty of God. Quite the opposite, actually. Quite the opposite. We pray in confidence... Because we believe that God is sovereign. God in his sovereign will has ordained that certain things will only happen 
because they were prayed for. They will only happen because they were prayed for. Would Samuel have been born if Hannah had not prayed for a son? Would Peter have been released from prison if the church had not been praying for his release? Would you have been converted if someone was not praying for your conversion? We refer to prayer as an ordinary means of grace. In other words, it is the daily practice of prayer and reading our Bible and the weekly attendance at public worship that enables us to be the people of God and to do what God wants us to do. Esther didn't get a voice from a burning bush like Moses. She didn't get a visit from an angel like Gideon. She didn't get any of these things before she did the right thing. And in that respect, she's like us, isn't she? We pray. We may even fast. And then we do the right thing according to God's word. Bible teacher Tim Chester is right when he says this. We express our belief in God's sovereignty most when we pray in the expectation that he can intervene in human lives and human history to bring about the things that we pray for. From eternity, he has woven our prayers into the cause and effect of the universe. He has woven our prayers into the cause and effect of the universe. And friends, if that is not wonderful enough for you, when we approach our heavenly king, when we approach him in prayer, we do not need to wonder whether or not he will extend the gold scepter whether or not we will be granted an audience. He always, always extends the gold scepter. Hebrews 4 verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So let's just do that as we come before the Lord with our prayers for our world and for ourselves. Let's approach the throne of grace with confidence. Heavenly Father, day and daily, we find ourselves at a crossroad with a decision to make. Do we act with sacrificial love or do we look out for number one? Do we build up or do we tear down? Do we speak up or do we remain silent? O oh Lord, grant us the courage to do the right thing in accordance with your word. And we pray for our brothers and sisters throughout the world for whom acting righteously is to invite persecution. Esther's words are their words. If I perish, I perish. O oh Lord, assure them that because Jesus Christ has conquered death, they shall never perish, but enjoy eternal life. And Lord, while we won't be executed for practicing our faith, we will have to live with the consequences. And Father God, that can be just as frightening. May your Holy Spirit enable us to overcome our fears. And those who would oppose us, to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We pray for His Majesty the King and for all our elected representatives. We commend particularly 
Christians in Parliament to you who may jeopardize their career by speaking gospel truth to those who do not want to hear it. We thank you for those who remember who their true master is. And gracious Lord, we commit this week's General Assembly to you and pray that all the decisions would be for your glory and the Christian good of Scotland. Bless Bob Ackroyd, our new moderator, and assure him of your presence throughout all the proceedings. And Lord, we thank you for those men who have responded to your call to be heralds of the good news and pastors of your church. It gives us such hope for the future. May their zeal for Christ only increase as they prepare for the task ahead. Now, dear Lord, we bring before you those who lay heavy on our hearts, those we love so much but who are in trouble. Perhaps they are ill or anxious. Perhaps they're causing us to be anxious. In the silence, we name them to you, Lord. And Father God, we do particularly commend Moira to you as she faces Friday's funeral. We pray that you would uphold her and may she know that not only you, but her church family are surrounding her with love and care. Eternal God, we remember with thanksgiving those who have left this world and are now at home with you, especially those who strengthened our weak faith built up our trust in you, and by their life drew us into the life of Christ, who died in weakness, but reigns in glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, let's conclude our service. All my hope on God is founded. All my trust he shall renew. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
this day and forevermore. Amen.